This is Mrs. O'Neill for Chapter 6, Section 3, Part 3, Electronegativity, the last periodic trend you are responsible for understanding and knowing. So pause the video, fill in those blanks, and then play to hear my words. So electronegativity and ionization energy are similar. They have the similar trends. But let me remind you that ionization energy is the ability to remove, how much energy is needed to remove electrons from an atom, whether that atom wants electrons to be removed or gained, right? So it's how much energy is needed to remove. Electronegativity is similar in the fact that the, it's the ability of one atom to attract electrons to itself. So how much energy or how much ability an atom has to actually take somebody else's electron away because when they bond with another atom, it's all about that bonding. Who in that bond has the more or the greater amount of ability, the greater amount of energy to take the other electrons away? So the trend is going to be very similar, or I should say the same as ionization energy. The reasoning why one atom is stronger than the other, why one has more electronegativity than the other, is again the same reasoning as ionization energy. The difference is we're talking about when atoms are bonded to another atom. It's the tug of war. It's the battle between the two atoms. Which one is going to be stronger? Which one's going to hold on to those electrons more often? So again, like I said, the trend is the same. Going down the group, the electronegativity of those elements are going to decrease. The elements are going to get weaker as they get bigger. They're not going to have the strength to grab anybody's electrons. However, when you go across the period, the atoms be, tend to get stronger. They have a stronger ability to grab those electrons, so they're going to have a higher electronegativity value. So let's look at what are our most active elements. So here are the electronegativity values for all the elements. I shouldn't say all of them, but for a nice representation of them. And if we notice here, again, this is going to be a thicker line here because this is groups one and two. Oh, let's review. Alkali metals, group one, one word. Alkaline earth metals, group two, two words. And then you get into your, basically your non-metals here. I should say, here's your metalloids. There's that stair step line in there somewhere. And here's your non-metals. So this is going to be group 17, your halogens, 16, 15, 14, and 13. And remember, this is a nice representation of our valence electrons. So one valence electrons, two valence electrons, group 13 has three, 14, 4, 15, 5, 16, 6, and then 17, 7. So notice the numbers as we go down the group, the values decrease. And as we go across, the values increase. So if we're talking about the most active metal, so if we're talking about this area right here, who do you think out of all these metals would be the most active? Now, this is a little trick though. I'm not really looking for the highest electronegativity value. I'm actually looking for the lowest electronegativity value because he's going to be the weakest guy. So francium, and that's why I had to add him here at the bottom, francium is going to be the most active metal because he actually has the lowest electronegativity value. So he's going to be the weakest of all the elements. So make sure that you pause and write these notes into your packet. So hopefully this makes sense. Francium is huge, right? He is in period one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He is in the last period of the periodic table, which means that his one valence electron, because he's in group one, is all the way in the seventh energy level. It is all the way out there. So he's kind of the weakest link. Anybody can take that one valence electron that's all the way out there. So that means he's going to be very, very reactive. On the other hand, 
who is going to be our most active nonmetal? Again, we'll look in this section over here. So now, are we looking again for the lowest electronegativity value, or are we looking for the highest electronegativity value? Because nonmetals tend to gain electrons. So fluorine is going to be our most active nonmetal. Again, the Y, if we look at these values, he has the highest electronegativity. So he actually is the strongest strongest of all the elements. I actually refer to him a lot as the bully. Fluorine is going to be the bully of all those elements because he's the strongest. He's the smallest and he's the strongest. So he's small and mighty because he has a high electronegativity value and he's very small. He can kind of get into any of those crevices and he can take anybody's electrons that come near him. So just as a, again, a nice visual here, Francine is going to be the weakest because he has that one valence electron all the way out here, right? So there's going to be no Coulomb's attraction. Remember about that, that Coulomb's law, that Coulomb's attraction, the, the, the positive nuclei here and that one lonely negative electron out here, there's going to be very, very little attraction between those two. So Francium says, hey, take them away because I have so many other electrons anyways. Where fluorine, on the other hand, he has seven valence electrons. He only needs one more to be happy and he is so small. So he gets into anybody's area, he's going to take anybody's electron. And that's one of the reasons he actually bonds with xenon. Now, xenon, ladies and gentlemen, has an atomic number of 54. He is a noble gas. He's already happy. But fluorine, because he is the bully of the periodic table, he can steal xenon's electrons. That's how strong he is. So I just mentioned this, what group of elements are not active at all and why? Well, we just talked about xenon and again, ooh, I think I got the wrong number. No, xenon was 54. So group 18, right? Those, those noble gases are not active at all. Why? Because they have those eight valence electrons and they're already happy. Okay, except for that bully of fluorine, that's the only compound I know of, xenon with fluorine, and that's because of that bully. Okay, so they are already stable, and they don't need any more electrons. So let's look at these practice problems. So we are looking for the smaller of the pair. So again, get out your periodic table. I do have one here for reference if you need it, but now find SC, which is scandium, and uranium. Should have found them right there. They are in the same peer, oh, sorry, same group. And as we go down the group, our electronegativity decreases. So which of these two is going to have the smaller electronegativity? You got it. Yttrium. I think I said yttrium. I might have said uranium by accident. I'm sorry. Um, so letter B, francium and sodium, if we can find those elements on the periodic table. Should have paused, looked at your periodic table and found them here. Again, they're in the same group and as we go down, they get smaller. So francium is gonna have a smaller electronegativity value than sodium. All right, can you do C and D on your own? Hopefully you paused the video, you found MN, which is manganese, different than magnesium, manganese, and AS arsenic. So did you find them here in the same period and choose manganese? Because as we go across, our electronegativity gets bigger. And P and SI, phosphorus and silicon, they are side by side in the same period. So you should have chosen silicon. Okay, practice problem number two. Larger electronegativity, again, same kind of concept, but you're looking for the one that has the larger electronegativity value. Uh, a big hint, right? Again, fluorine is the bully. So the closer the element is to fluorine, the larger your electronegativity value. The farther away from fluorine, the less your electronegativity value. And again, the same thing goes for ionization energy. So if we look at letter A, I and F, again, they're both in the same group. However, we already know that fluorine is the bully, so we're going to choose him. And for B, we have fluorine and boron this time in the same 
period, again, as you get closer to fluorine or as you go across to the right uh, uh, during a period, um, you're going to gain electronegativity values. So again, fluorine being the bully would be the answer. All right, pause the video and see if you can do C and D. Hopefully you paused the video and gave it a try. You should have found cobalt and nickel, and you should have chose nickel, and beryllium and barium, and you should have chosen, that's right, beryllium. Okay, um, here we go. So here's a summary of the trends. Um, I will have them better or all together for you to put those arrows into your uh, packet. But atomic size, again, as we go down, I always like to talk about going down a group, what happens, and going across what happens. And honestly, atomic size is the only one that does the opposite. There's three main um, periodic trends that you need to know. Atomic size, ionization energy, and electronegativity. Atomic size is the only one that does the opposite. So here's ionization energy, again, opposite of atomic radius, and electronegativity is the same as ionization energy. So you should have on your packet of notes, like a short, little, small periodic table, uh, you should draw in the arrows. Again, this is how I like to remember them, but you can remember them any way you'd like. Um, and if you write in ionic size, that's fine too, but that really goes by the ions, right? The atom becoming an ion and what's happening there, the ion versus the atom, uh, which one would be smaller or larger. So here's our last quiz. Hopefully you pause the video, you found those elements on the periodic table, and which one is closest to fluorine would be the highest or the most electronegative. Okay, we will see you in class and hopefully these trends, uh, especially doing those practice problems, now makes a little bit more sense.